Welcome to the 2018 Constitution Day Lecture to form a more perfect union combating the politics of fear and anger. My name is Elizabeth Maddow. I'm the director of the Center for Youth Political Participation at the Eagleton Institute of Politics. And we're bringing you this lecture tonight um, thanks to the Darien Fund for the United States Constitution, Citizenship, and Civic Engagement. Um, the Darians, Susan and Stephen Darian, are alums of Rutgers, unfortunately are not able to be here tonight, but we do want to take a moment to thank them, to acknowledge them for their support and their commitment to this initiative. We also want to take a moment right now to thank all of our co-sponsors for tonight's event, Undergraduate Academic Affairs, Rutgers Society of History, Student Centers and Activities, Rutgers NAACP, Rutgers New Student Orientation and Family Programs, and Rutgers Women's Political Caucus. So thank you all for the support tonight. Now, although it officially took place on Monday, September 17th, our center has been celebrating Constitution Day all week. Um, we've been out on campus. We registered students to vote on Monday. We registered New Brunswick High School students to vote on Tuesday. We're going to be registering more Rutgers students tomorrow. Um, we've been out and about on campus giving out pocket constitutions whenever we can, and even training Rutgers students gr student groups how to register their members of their organizations. Tonight is, is different. Tonight's an opportunity really to reflect on why we do all of that. Constitution Day recognizes the adoption of the Constitution in 1787 and allows all of us, our students in particular, um, an opportunity to consider and to appreciate the ideals contained within the Constitution. At the same time, it challenges us to identify those times both throughout American history and in contemporary politics when we've fallen short of these ideals and to redouble our efforts to make our union more perfect. So that's certainly what motivates the work that we do. That's the, it motivates the work of our guest speaker, Alelia Bundles, and it certainly spurs the work undertaken by the person I have the pleasure of introducing, New Jersey Secretary of State Tahisha Way. Throughout her career, um, T Secretary Way has served as a judge, as an educator, as a public servant, and is a passionate supporter of civic engagement and civic education. Uh, like many of our Rutgers students, um, it was her commitment to public service really was fostered as an undergraduate at Brown University, um, where she served as vice president of the <laughs> vice president of the NAACP. Can everyone still hear me? I'm still here. Okay, good. Um, president of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. Uh, she taught religious education. She even was a radio announcer for the college radio station, which I think is impressive. Um, she was just as busy in law school. Um, she earned her law degree from the University of Virginia School of Law at Charlottesville, during which time, again, she was a busy woman. She was a law clerk um, for the Virginia Legal Aid Society, for the United Steelworkers of America, and for Polygram. Um, and she also served during her time in law school as the social chair for the Black Law Students Association. She acted as a peer advisor, a big sister with the Action for Better Living, and was a member of the Articles Review Board for the Virginia Environmental Law Journal. Prior to her, um, her appointment as the Secretary of State here in New Jersey, she had a rich public career. She served as an administrative law judge for the state of New Jersey. She was a freeholder for the Passaic County Board of Chosen Freeholders and a council member for the New Jersey Highlands Water Protection and Planning Council. Tahisha Way was appointed by Governor Murphy to serve as New Jersey's 34th Secretary of State. And during her tenure, she certainly has put her passion for political participation into practice. Um, I know she's had a very busy week. She's been a very busy woman in celebration of Constitution Day, has been visiting college campuses and high schools and grade schools throughout the state, and even not launched an exciting new initiative called Ballot Bowl, which is a friendly, nonpartisan voter registration competition between the state's colleges and universities. And Rutgers University is certainly proud to be participating. Um, so go Rutgers, get registered. Um, we're honored to have the Secretary with us tonight to introduce our Constitution Day speaker. So please join me in welcoming New Jersey Secretary of State, Tahisha Way.
Good evening. And thank you, Elizabeth, and of course, Rutgers and Eagleton. My friends, it is indeed an honor to welcome you to this 2018 Constitution Day Lecture. This year's theme, To Form a More Perfect Union, Combating the Politics of Fear and Anger, really has resonated with me. My friends, we are indeed at an inflection point in our history. To paraphrase Tolstoy, conservatives, progressives, and those in between are each unhappy in their own way. Yet, as Americans, I believe that we have been presented with an opportunity to decide what kind of future we collectively want. As a lawyer and former judge, something that has been deeply ingrained in me is a love and respect of the Constitution. It is a hopeful and living document, a roadmap to our evergreen optimism for that more perfect union. Look at the grassroots energy, regardless of viewpoints that have indeed overtaken our nation. And many topics, like the appointment of a United States Supreme Court Justice, are now capturing the public imagination in such a visceral and direct way. So now we, the people, indeed is resounding. And tonight, there is no better person to guide us in coming to that more perfect union than our presenter, the Alilia Bundles. Now, Ms. Bundles graduated magna cum laude from Harvard College and Radcliffe College and earned a master's degree from the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. She has worked as an executive and producer in network television news, serving as director of talent development for ABC News in Washington, DC and New York, deputy bureau chief of ABC News in Washington, and as a producer with ABC's World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. More recently, Ms. Bundles has spent much of her time on the board of directors of the Foundation for the National Archives in Washington, DC, and just completed a term as president and chairwoman of that board. She also has offered, authored the foreword to President Barack Obama's speeches published by the National Archives, to serving as president of the Madam Walker a Lilia Walker Family Archives in which she shares her rich history of her ancestors. She is author of the 2001 critically acclaimed best-selling biography of her great-grandmother entitled, On Her Own Ground, The Life and Times of Madam C.J. Walker, based on nearly three decades of her meticulous research. Ms. Bundles is currently finishing her fifth book in her series of biographies of her great-grandmother, also entitled The Joy Goddess of Harlem, Alilia Walker and the Harlem Renaissance. Folk, tonight's Constitution Day speaker has urged us to use the charters of freedom as a framework for debate to settle conflicts and promote civility. To seek common ground and common cause to work together to turn our ever evolving, ever imperfect union into a more perfect union. So without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Rutgers, Rutgers University 2018 Constitution Day speaker, 
the Alilia Bundles. Well, I have to say, you are the hardest working woman in state government. <laughs> and a soror, thank you. <laughs> and I was a college DJ, so hey, <laughs> we, we need to get together. It is just such a delight to be here, and I have to do a shout out to my college ca classmate, Kathy Kleeman, um, who worked at the Eagleton Institute for 37 years. So she has just retired, and I'm looking at that retirement thing. That sounds really good. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really, I've, I've had such a good time talking with Elizabeth Matto over the last few months uh, about what we would talk about today and this year's theme uh, for Constitution Day. And, you know, I have to say this, there is so much. I, I started, I, when I have to do a speech, I make a folder, and I drop articles in, you know, or I make notes and in the middle of the night or whatever, and the next morning I drop them in the photo. This photo got to be this <laughs> thick, and it was still growing today, because there's so much, like, it's a civics lesson every single day now. Um, you know, if we, you know, we, it's the Supreme Court, it's the Congress, it's local school board races. I mean, we really need to be educated, and it is challenging um, but at the same time, this is what we're supposed to do as American citizens. We are really supposed to know what's going on. So I am glad for the work that the Eagleton Institute does and glad for the Center for Youth Political Participation. How many people here are working with youth political? There you go. Yeah, everybody is. Everybody is. Great. <laughs> but every day we are reminded that there was a wisdom among the founding fathers when they decided 231 years ago that we should have three branches of government. Legislative, executive, judicial. Now I know everybody in this room knows that, but you know there's that story, I, don't, you know, I, I think this story is true, I don't think it's just apocryphal that there is some, there's a survey on civics that says that there were, when people were asked about the three branches of government, they couldn't name them, but they knew the names of the three stooges. I, you know, maybe that's true, maybe not. But you know, but it, that it's. But there are probably more people who actually know that. I mean, that's just kind. Of, it's like the old Jay Leno, uh, man on the street thing. But that's just really frightening. Um, and the founding fathers were wise because they knew that if we had, if the, if this was, if these three branches were working in the way they were intended, they would provide checks and balances on each other, so that one branch did not have more power than the other. They did not want to see arbitrary and unfair decisions. And when we're out of balance, arbitrary and unfair <laughs> decisions happen. The opening paragraph of the Constitution bears repeating. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States. So there was a lot of fighting and a lot of arguing and compromise that went into creating the final document. And it's really just on three big pieces of parchment that sit in the National Archives. So it's very compact. I read something that said, most constitutions only last 19 years. We have made it 231 years, but it's always in question. <laughs> but you know, and that three, on those three pages, I mean, there was all that fighting and compromise, but they, it was not perfect. They left out some critical issues like slavery that they didn't really want to deal with. They pushed that down the road. They left out some of those issues that were facing the young republic, and you know when you bury things, they erupt eventually, and that is in fact what happened. And out in the open and behind closed doors, there was anger. And Elizabeth and I talked about this. The theme this year for so much of the conversation is anger. And as I thought about the theme, about anger's role in politics, I had to contemplate its causes, its purposes, and its consequences. Who is angry and why? 
How did they get angry? What are they doing with that anger? What role does fear play in stoking the anger? And that's what we talked about unpacking that because for me, there's, yes, people are angry and we sort of have this cliche now, people are voting based on anger. But for me, that's, it's really fear. You know, what are you afraid of losing? Everybody has kind of their favorite amendment, the thing that they feel most threatened by. Is it the Second Amendment, the First Amendment, the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment? What is it that is the thing that you are most afraid of losing that is the thing that motivates your anger and that motivates you to do something? And what role does bigotry and resentment play in intensifying anger? But anger is a powerful motivator. It can be used for good and it can be used for evil. Anger can motivate us to address injustice and leaders can use it to create hope and to make laws that work for all the people. Demagogues can use it to create division and manipulate grievances. In fact, the most adept demagogues can stoke anger in order to develop a following and solidify power. They can manufacture fear and resentment with misinformation and bigotry. They can whip a crowd into a frenzy. They can stand in a stadium and yell slogans and plant the seeds of violence. They can make incendiary statements that undermine the foundations of our democracy. And they can tell outright lies that destroy the credibility of the institutions that hold a society together. Our founding fathers worried about demagogues and tried to create a document that would prevent them from flourishing. They hoped for leaders who would observe the rule of law and steal a, steer us toward civility and unity. But anger has been very much a part of what built America. Every 4th of July, I sit on the steps of the National Archives and watch reenactors read the Declaration of Independence. George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Ned Hector, who was a black patriot, um, Abigail Adams, and they're dressed up in those hot wool costumes <laughs> that they have to wear, and it's always very hot. But they're there before a big crowd reading parts of the Declaration of Independence. And it really is an amazing docu document. Most of us know that first paragraph. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But in fact, it is a list of 27 grievances against King George. You know, some, there have been surveys that say there are lots of people who read the Declaration of Independence and they think it's a subversive document and they wouldn't support it now. But that's how our country started. It was 27 grievances against King George. Things like he has obstructed the administration of justice. He has deprived us in many cases of the benefit of trial by jury. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. So what happens on the steps of the National Archives when that happens is that there, people say, huzzah, which is what people said in 1776, or boo when they don't agree with it. But it's just, I, I've been doing this for about a decade, and it's, I re, if you have any place where they read the Declaration of Independence on 4th of July, go. Because it, is, it just reinvigorates you. For me, it um, helps me reestablish why I'm an American and what it means. And even though everything, I don't think everything is right about what we do, I'm reminded of what our aspirations are. That, and that's really what Constitution Day is about. What are our aspirations? Who are we going to be as a people? And we have to recommit ourselves to that often. The Declaration of Independence was a document that threw down the gauntlet, a declaration born of anger and outrage against the king. And we know that while the sentiments for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness were enshrined in this document, they did not apply to everyone in those 13 colonies and in the territories on the rest of the continent. In fact, when I did, I did a speech a few years ago on the 4th of July, and I talked about you know, the aspirations, 
But I also talked about who wasn't in the room in 1776. Women were not in the room. African Americans who were enslaved were not in the room. Native Americans were not in the room. But that we continue to try to work towards a more perfect union. I quoted Frederick Douglass's speech in 1852 he, when he said, what does, the fourth, what does your 4th of July mean to me? Because people were still enslaved. But then I tried to bring it back around to vote. Now we are coming together. We have aspirations. We are trying to be a more perfect union. And I was telling Elizabeth, I got an email the next day. Some guy tracked me down on my website and told me that I was entirely inappropriate. It was the wrong occasion. For, to me, for me to mention something like that. And I'm like, have you read the Declaration of Independence? <laughs> Do you know what the Declaration is about? It is about trying to make wrongs right and trying to make sure that we have aspirations to be a more inclusive nation. So throughout our history, anger has been a catalyst that has pushed us toward a more perfect union to live up to the words of the Charters of Freedom the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. And sometimes that anger has been retaliatory and resulted in violence and war. Sometimes it has taken the form of peaceful, civil disobedience. One of the things that is very much a part of my memory uh, as a young person was the Children's Crusade in Birmingham. And a lot of the times this protest and this anger comes from children who just don't understand why the world is, why evil is going on in the world and who are naive enough uh, and optimistic enough to, be, to want to make changes. We saw it in, port, in uh, Parkland. But anger in Birmingham, anger about not being able to vote that their parents couldn't vote, anger about lynchings that had gone unprosecuted, anger about the murders of four little girls at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. And when the images of the police using dogs and hoses, water hoses, to attack children appeared on the evening news and were shown all over the world, America's image was damaged. Those visuals were just too embarrassing and shameful. And a critical mass of Americans could no longer pretend that this level of bigotry didn't exist. And sometimes it takes that kind of moment to wake people up. You know, we don't want to think about having to do that. But sometimes that's what it takes. We, we get lulled into thinking everything is OK when everything is not OK. And we are having some of those moments today at immigration detention centers, in the Me Too movement, in the Catholic Church. A lot of things are going on where people just can't take it anymore. And, and their anger and their outrage is spurring them, I hope, to positive uh, ends. Many of the critiques of the 2016 election focused on the anger that fueled the decisions in the voting booths across America. Thousands of articles and books and monographs have examined the forces that the day after the inauguration brought hundreds of thousands of women to Washington, D.C. So now we look to the midterm elections in 47 days to see if there's going to be a backlash to the backlash. And we are so polarized. We are in a moment where decisions that are made in every 24-hour news cycle have the potential to empower one political perspective and diminish another. Where one appointment will feel like a win to one side and a defeat to another. These victories are often countered with anger. As a nation, we seem to have done a 180-degree shift from hope and optimism to anger and grievance. I was living in Washington, D.C. for the 20, 2008, 2012, and 2016 inaugurations. And walking around the streets, the atmosphere was very different. We are at a crossroads. We have faced this kind of monumental choice before. And as a nation, we have to make choices about who we want to be. And sometimes those, cha those choices are made on the very narrowest of margins. We faced these choices with the Revolutionary War, with the Civil War, with Reconstruction, with suffrage for women as we begin to think about celebrating the centennial of women's right to vote, the Civil Rights Movement, the Women's right, Rights Movement. So I want to be respectful of politics that, every, you know, it's volatile, it's, we're tribal, and 
not to um, be too partisan tonight, but I have to say that it would be disingenuous of me not to tell you that how I experience the Constitution may be different from how you experience the Constitution. I have to be honest with you and say that the rule of law grows, for me, grows out of my experience and out of who I am. So I am an American, and I am an American whose great, 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 great grandfathers, two of them, fought in the Revolutionary War in the Continental Army from North Carolina. So I feel like I am a real American. As a descendant of enslaved people, as well as free people of color, I am an American. Like most African Americans, I also find Europeans in my family tree. And they are there because enslaved women had no control over their bodies. As an African American who was born in the early 1950s and who lived through the Civil Rights Movement, and the political turmoil of the late 1960s. As a little black girl who went to predominantly white schools during the 1950s and 1960s. As a graduate of an Ivy League school who benefited from affirmative action. But I was not the first generation to go to college, nor was I the first one who had the brains to be able to handle that curriculum. As an American female, who always had access to birth control and the protections afforded by Roe versus Wade. I am a journalist who saw the power of newspapers and television during the Civil Rights Movement, during the Vietnam War, and during Watergate. And I make no apologies for pushing back as a journalist on people who say journalists are the enemies of the people. Because I know there are many instances where the only thing standing between corruption and horrible things are the journalists who are dedicated to digging for the truth. So much progress has happened in my lifetime, but I also know that what I see as progress often is met with resistance. The backlash to expanded rights is very much a part of the American narrative. So Brown versus Board of Education, I was born in 1952, that happened in 1955, that meant that doors were open to me that weren't open to my parents' generation, but Brown versus Board of Education was met with segregated academies and was met with a resistance to integration. The Voting Rights Act, I always had the right to vote. I, lived, I grew up in Indiana, so it wasn't like the segregated South, but Shelby V. Holder has cut back on those rights. The Fair Housing Act meant that whenever I wanted to go rent someplace or buy someplace, it was, I could have a lawsuit if somebody denied me that. But I know that federal housing policies, legal federal housing policies denied loans to people of color and predatory lending laws hurt them. I mean, I will just, you know, when I grew up in Indianapolis, my parents and many of their peers moved to a new, newly built black suburb in Indianapolis all of the fathers were veterans of World War II and the Korean War. They were school teachers and doctors and carpenters and entrepreneurs. They could not get loans from banks because loans were not given to people, black people with GI bills and who were, who were employed because the banks did not have to do that. And therefore, the wealth creation among middle class African Americans is not the same for their white peers. So, there, you, you can see the differences over time. But the generations that have come after these battles seem to be taking some of these freedoms for granted. And I think people in my generation have allowed ourselves to be lulled in believing that these rights would always be there. But the Constitution and our history in America says these rights are not there unless we fight for them, unless we vote, unless we participate. I think part of the reason we don't understand how things work is that there's not enough civics in schools. I'm hoping that New Jersey is now gonna, is gonna work to mandate civics in schools. I'm trying to plant that seed, and, and those of us at the National Archives are trying to, to plant that seed because it really does make a difference if you don't know. You don't know your civil liberties if there's, if there's not civics in schools. But part of it also is history is not taught. If it's not on the test, you don't have to teach it. 
And I know that what I do every day when I write about the women in my family, I, I spend all my days in, in history. I go through old newspapers. I'm on Ancestry.com. My library is full of books on the history of America. I'm not as well versed on world history as I'd like to be, but history of America I'm pretty good on. But I hated history in high school. And I hated history in high school because it didn't seem to relate to me. I had this distinct memory of being in my history class. And I, I felt like I was the only black person in the class. So one of my friends said she was there too. Maybe we, she and I weren't speaking to each other that, that week. I don't know. But I felt like I was the only one there. And I distinctly remember in this history book, the only time black people were mentioned was about slavery. And the paragraph that I remembered years later was, and the slaves, well, you know, now we say enslaved people as opposed to slaves, but the book said slaves were contented. Now, deep inside me, <laughs> I knew that wasn't true, but I didn't have any ammunition. I didn't have any knowledge. I didn't have any facts to argue with that. And I always had that sense. I just felt this, you know, burning shame about that. And years later, I tried to track down the book. The school system didn't have a copy of the book. They didn't know what the title was. And a friend of mine who works in a university library tracked down that textbook for me. And in fact, that's what it said. It wasn't just my imagination. So there was nothing in that book that, said that had anything about the contributions of African American, nor women, nor Asian Americans, nor Latinos. You know, there was just nothing other than you know the sort of straight history that we that many of us learned during that era, there was nothing about Frederick Douglass. There was nothing about Ida B. Wells and her fight against lynching. Nothing about black soldiers like my great 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 something grandfather who was in the Revolutionary War. Nothing about the other great great grandmother who was who had her emancipation papers and who didn't want to be enslaved and who was freed. There was nothing about the other great great grandfather who held elective office during Reconstruction. In fact, Reconstruction was only scallywags and carpetbaggers. It was, poor, but my grandfather had told me that it was something different. But to the extent that history and social studies are even taught in our schools, it can be uninteresting and feel irrelevant, though I'm sure not <laughs> in your school. <laughs> I'm sure not in New Brunswick. But at worst, it is weaponized and politicized to fit a narrative. The difficult parts of our history are glossed over and sanitized. Just this month, we've learned that the Texas School Board, which controls a lot of the textbooks, has decided, or at least is considering, I'm hoping they're being shamed into something else, but at least is considering omitting mention of Hillary Clinton and Helen Keller in their curriculum. So regardless of one's political beliefs, it is stunning to deny <laughs> that Hillary Clinton is not an important historical figure. If nothing else, she was a first lady. Then we start with that. And then she was Secretary of State. And then she was the first woman to run for president in a major party. So even if you don't like her, she still is an important person in history. And Helen Keller, wasn't that the most inspirational biography you read in <laughs> elementary school? You know, how she worked with Ann Selva, and she was blind, she was deaf, and oh my God, if Helen Keller could accomplish this, certainly I could. Was that not inspirational? But I'm like, what? what? Why is this? And then I did a quick Google search, because you know, you can find stuff on Google, you have to double check it, but you can find it. And it revealed that she also was a socialist who was a supporter of the NAACP and civil rights for African Americans, and so I guess that made her subversive. So during her lifetime, she was censored. In 1933, the year that Hitler was named chancellor, there was a move to ban her books in Germany. And her response was an open letter, and they have, there's a copy of the actual letter, and first it's written to Hitler, and then that's marked out, and it's written to the school children of Germany. And she wrote, history has taught you nothing if you think you can kill ideas. Tyrants have tried to do that often before, and the ideas have risen up in their might and destroyed them. So ideals, ideas will prevail. But we know we are in a moment when we can no longer even agree on facts. 
and we don't seem to know how our government works. And that means we can't hold our elected officials accountable if we don't understand our Constitution and if we don't require civics lessons and history. You've heard the statistics about how poorly Americans do on civics, basic civics questions. That these surveys show that we just don't understand what's going on. And I'm hoping, I mean, I love that Constitution Day has become a thing <laughs> because I hope it will begin to correct some of these uh, deficits that we have. The rule of law is about finding the truth, not about partisan outcome. The legal process can be frustrating. When it works, democracy is strengthened. And when it is corrupted, democracy is weakened. When a person is profiled by race or religion or ethnicity and treated differently under the law, society suffers. When voting districts are gerrymandered to favor one party over another, citizens lose confidence in their vote. When Elizabeth and I talked about anger, again, I wanted to get to what, was, what is beyond the anger? What is the fear? What, how do people feel threatened? And I feel right now we, you know, we're in a death match in America. That one person's gain is another person's loss. And I think when I was an idealistic high school student, I thought if, everybody, if one person advanced, everybody else advanced. That we were, as a society, we wanted to make sure that there was diversity, that people were you know, becoming more equal. And I'm now discovering that everybody doesn't believe that. We are in a moment when the demographics are changing. While some Americans value the changes and believe we are stronger because of our diversity, there are those who are threatened by it. While some Americans value our history of immigration, there are others who want to close the doors. They have amnesia that their ancestors were once unwelcomed. I have to tell you that I cringe when I hear people talk about real Americans. In fact, to get to the theme of this evening, I am really angry <laughs> when people talk about real Americans, because I know what that means for some people, is that being white is the only way to be a real American. And the truth is that Native Americans are the original Americans, and there would be no America as we know it without the unpaid labor of people of African descent. So what I know is that I had ancestors who were here who were fighting during the Revolutionary War. And I believe that when one group of Americans is discriminated against, we are vulnerable as a nation. The consequences to bigotry and to leaders who rely on hatred really will destroy us. And in some ways, we've been here before. So Kathy and I, not the rest of you, are old enough to remember <laughs> in the 1950s, Sputnik and the threat that that brought and duck and cover and hiding under your desk and a communist under every bed and the Red Scare. Uh, and e but even then, the Soviet Union knew that they could exploit us on these differences and on this tribalism. Um, I thought the Red Scare was just a bunch of hooey uh, as a kid, and I remember that one of, my, one of the government teachers in my school thought Earth Day was a communist plot. <laughs> and when I wore an armband on moratorium day, because uh, I was woke, uh, <laughs> that there was some rumor that he wanted me expelled from school. But one thing, the, so the Soviet Union knew that they could exploit us on race, and they did it throughout the 21st century. They did it during World War I when they sent leaflets um, over the black, the black soldiers and the white soldiers in France and said that there was you know, something that black soldiers were inferior and they were exploiting the white supremacy of that era. But we know that this has happened again. That I don't know how many of you read the big article in the New York Times today, but it's a for me a must read because it really does a sort of a timeline of how, this, how Russia has weaponized Facebook and Twitter and interfered with the 2016 election. So two examples. In St. Petersburg, Russia on March 15, 2016, hackers at a secret Russian military unit were posing as Americans and posting attacks on the Democratic candidate on Facebook and Twitter. In addition to attacking one candidate and praising another, the trolls exploited American citizens' feelings about immigration and race. Russian trolls were working, who were working for what was called the Internet Research Agency 
created accounts with fake identities and organizations. In May of 2016, a Facebook page with the name Heart of Texas announced a rally at an Islamic center in downtown Houston with the purpose of attacking Muslims. The page eventually had almost a quarter million people signed up. And it didn't take long for some other Texans to sort of take the bait and add their own comments and threats. The announcement drew just about a dozen white supremacists, including two who showed up with assault weapons and a few with Confederate flags. And the counter protesters also responded to another fake page. I guess it was a real page with a fake identity. And they came up to confront the white supremacists. The Houston police were there. They dispersed the people. They made sure nothing really horrible happened. But you can see where this goes. In my neighborhood, the pizza parlor where Pizzagate happened, where a conspiracy theorist told people that there was some under, you know, in the basement there was some sex ring going on, um, and a man showed up with a rifle to shoot people. So if we allow ourselves to believe in conspiracy theories, if we don't sometimes at the Thanksgiving table shut them down, they grow. It matters because conspiracy theories that used to be easily dismissed as fantasies of the unhinged take hold. Anger, fear, resentment, outright lies, and blatant racism allowed Americans, a lot of Americans, to believe that President Obama was born in Kenya, which clearly is not the case. So what do we do? You know, I've sort of stuck myself with this title of combating the politics of fear and anger because I really just can't stay in anger. I think we have to figure out whether we will stay in this dance, this toxic dance of anger, fear, and hatred, this tribalism, or whether we will find ways to move forward that we can acknowledge the injustice of the past and the inequality that exists as a result while we find common ground and a common set of facts. Is our anger going to be used for the greater good or to make us attack one another? Honestly, there are times when I'm not so charitable about this when I scream at the television. But I know outrage is not sustainable. Thank goodness for the work of the Eagleton Institute. I was encouraged today when, I don't know if Jessica Ronan is here or not, but Jessica picked me up from the train station and she talked to me about the work she's doing to register students at Rutgers and in local high schools to register them to vote. So I know that there is hope and I have to hold on to that hope. But we have to insist on facts. We have to read widely. Um, there's too much to read, but I, it, I get a digest of four or five things every day in email. I can't even read all of those, but at least I know what the main headlines are in politics and media. We have to challenge those friends and family members who believe in conspiracy theories. We have to challenge them on their bigotry. You know, all institutions make mistakes, and as a longtime journalist, I know that journalism is not perfect. Um, but I know that the, those ones that I trust, if they make a mistake and they make mistakes, they admit them and they try to admit them really quickly. It's better not to make them, but you must make the retractions. On those days when I scream at the television, I know that I have work to do. Um, when I don't watch television, I actually feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Today I haven't seen much television. I think I'm in a good mood. <laughs> and yet I know that I really don't have the luxury of ignoring what is going on. Being a citizen is about eternal vigilance. When we abdicate to others, we are not exercising our responsibilities. It is challenging and exhausting. But what choice do we really have? Disengaging is not really an option. We have to use our community, we have to use our friends, we have to use our brains, our education, our knowledge to try to make this a more perfect union. We have to use those charters of freedom as the framework for debate. We have to try to be more civil to each other and to seek common ground. Thank you. So 
I just want to, I meant to hold this up. So this is my constitution. It's not read well enough, but one of the people who inspired me most, Peter Jennings, who is you know, long gone now, but Peter was born in Canada, became an American citizen, but Peter always carried, always had the Constitution in his pocket. And I think we read the Constitution, unless we're lawyers, we don't really understand the Constitution, but we need to have civics class. <laughs> Thank you. We have, ooh, excuse me, we have um, two wireless mics that will walk around and we'll stay away from that speaker so we don't <laughs> blow any earbuds out. Um, but if you want to raise, if you don't mind, just introducing yourself and stating your Rutgers affiliation so that our speaker knows with whom she is. Okay. First question. Okay. Thank you for being such a great audience. I really appreciate it. Hi, Debbie. I worked with Lilia Washington, D.C., ABC. And here's my copy, and she's... Okay, when you had all those books in your office in Washington, D.C., and I... <laughs> I don't, but I, I'm sure my office was messy because... <laughs> Okay. And so I still have my cop. Let me just thank you. Did you have a question? Or? Okay. I'm going to walk around with the other one and we'll try and see if this see mic works a little better. Gentleman here who has a question. Sure. This gentleman here? Thank you very much for an interesting talk. There's something called, I think it's called the national popular vote. Mm. The, the, uh, the, the law that a bunch of states have passed where the, I don't know if you're familiar. I'm not. Oh. So educate me, please. <laughs> it's where um, if, a, if a majority, if enough states with 270 electoral votes pass this law, they will agree as a group to vote for the presidential candidate that uh, wins the popular vote. Mm. It's a way to, 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 to abolish work the around electoral the electoral college. college. Right. So I, obviously you're not familiar with the law, with the proposal, and it's passed in, a num and it's passed in New Jersey, I think, uh, in, a, in states that add up to about 155 electoral votes, something like that, a lot of the big states. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, I, I, mean I, I listen. I am the thing that I when I watch television every night, and I hear all those uh, all the journalists say, and I'm not a lawyer, you know, and so, I don't play one on television. So my and, question, my question is, uh, what's your view of the electoral college as a, as a democratic process? Right. Just as a, like a non-lawyer, a non-elected yeah, official, just my personal either. opinion. I, it feels anachronistic to me. I, that's just my, you know without any real study, but, you know, if, if there are things that's just uh, superficially that made sense when we were a nation of, you know, a few hundred thousand people and were scattered and didn't have real communication with each other and you sort of had to trust the people, a small group of people who were much more educated than most of the population. So I wish we could have a real honest conversation about, about it. Uh, I think we're in a moment when it's very hard to have a real honest conversation. Uh, Joe Melton, uh, wife or husband of Kathy Kleeman. Uh, Hi, Joe. Joe and I see each other every <laughs> five years at reunions. Uh, I, I've always thought one of the more unfortunate characteristics of humans is they're perfectly willing to engage in really nasty behavior if they can do it anonymously. And unfortunately, we're giving them a lot of ways to do it anonymously these days. Do you think there's any way to correct this at all? No, because, I mean, we, you know, we have lots of ways to hide. You know, this, as I thought about this and I was thinking about high school, I remember my sociology class and the word ain't no me. You know, and <laughs> it's a topic that, I mean, I've never, it's not a word I use every day. But we, essentially when society breaks down, 
um, when we are at odds with each other. And now, yes, now there's so many ways to, um, to go after people, to bully people, to do it anonymously. And, you know, and actually now, a lot of people aren't even anonymous. You know, they feel quite happy and quite comfortable doing things really out in the open. So it has been unleashed. Now the question is, well, you know, is there going to be a reset? Um, I think when I was in high school, and there, you know, 196, I graduated in 1970, 1968, assassinations, um, the war in Vietnam, people at odds with each other, people saying, you know, love it or leave it if you don't love America, and me thinking, but you know, I'm a real American, so I'm not really leaving here. Um, but it was a really tumultuous time, and I don't, I don't know, you know, qualitatively how, if it's really different, because ex I was experiencing that as an 18-year-old, and I'm experiencing that as a much older person with context. But I don't know if in my lifetime we'll get you know, sort of the, whether the pendulum will swing back. I hope it does. We have a student question after yes. the well. Hi. Hi, my name is Linnea. I'm an associate here. Um, I was just wondering, so you touched on the one-sidedness of history, um, and I know a lot of us feel that, and I've afforded the opportunity to be in the Africana Studies Department, but there was so much that I learned so old, so I'm wondering how you think we can combat that at younger ages. I'm still, you know, I'm still learning. I mean, one of the things, Kathy, when I retire is that I want to read all those books, the unread books in my library. You know, it's, history is really weaponized. And, you know, for, for the Texas State School Board, not just the Hillary Clinton, Helen Keller piece, but, you know, like two years ago, the social, a social studies text said that um, people of African descent were workers, you know, not that they were enslaved and working against their will. So there are ways that history is sanitized, and so a lot of it has to do, families have to do it, and people have to be curious on their own. The good news now is that a school board and a text cannot control your mind, that you have opportunities to find the information in other ways. National History Day is a way that young people do it. But you know, there, are, there are hundreds, thousands of websites now and books that are rewriting American history. One of the things I think within, you know, certainly in my lifetime, the number of people who now in history departments are studying women and people of color. Forty years ago that was not happening because the head of the history department would say that's not a legitimate topic for you to study. And that has been thrown on its ear and people are really re-examining. So they're re-examining things like what was the value of enslaved people and that they were the greater part of the economy at the time of the Civil War? What was happening with redlining and federal housing? So there, you can, the information is there and it is really upon you in many, in many ways to educate yourself because it's not necessarily gonna be done in school. And educate, you know, have something for the kids in your neighborhood and make sure that they're reading and that they're learning. Have your own library you know, when you get to the point where you can do that when you're out of school, have a little library. I have a lot of kids' books. I don't have children of my own, but I have kids' books. I buy them because I want, you know, and I give books to kids as baby gifts. I mean, I want to help educate the next generation. Yeah. Hi, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm a little nervous, so bear with me if I slip up. Don't be nervous. <laughs> I'm not scary in any way. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the crowd might be. <laughs> so I'm a junior here at Rutgers. Um, I'm taking a class on globalization right now in the political science department. And I think the comments of my professor made me much more pessimis pessimistic than I was maybe a semester ago. And they make me think that maybe civics education is, of course, important, but our solution might need, might demand a lot more than that. And I wanted your thoughts on it. So he said that after the Berlin Wall fell, we before sorry bef during the Cold War we always assumed that capitalism and democracy went hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, and so my professor said that you know after the Berlin Wall fell, that was our assumption, but he believes that capitalism has won, but democracy has not won as much. And we might be seeing that in the United States with some backsliding here. So I kind of wanted your thoughts on the idea that we might be facing more than a need for civics education, but a structural issue because so many people have been left behind because of capitalism leading to a backlash. 
Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. I, you know, I can't. I can't argue with that. Um, there is a lot of inequality, and that is the current policies are continuing that. You know, the people who have a lot want to keep a lot. Um, so, but I think that I think there is. You know, when, when people say I'm not voting because my vote doesn't make a difference, and when you look at the the voting, um, especially among young people, and and there's a real. You know, it's really easy to be cynical and to just say forget it. But if you don't vote and if there's not some collective sense among young people that they need to vote, there's never going to be anybody who represents their interest. I mean, that's the only way to get somebody to represent your interest is to vote and to show up and to demand and then to run yourself. I mean, you don't have to be the person who runs, but you have to show up and you have to hold them accountable. So it won't change unless that happens. And even then, you still have to work after it changes. You still have to stay vigilant. So you're, I don't think your professor is actually wrong. And that's kind of depressing. <laughs> and, I'm, you know, and I'm saying, you know, I, again, I graduated from high school almost 50 years ago. And I thought I was really optimistic that the world was changing and that, I wasn't, that those rights that I was getting were really going to sort of be there forever. Because didn't everybody think that I should have those rights? And now I know that everybody doesn't think I should. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm a student at Rutgers. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned the thing about the importance of challenging friends and family, say, at the Thanksgiving dinner table about bigotry and conspiracy. Yes, good luck. <laughs> that's, that's, ex that's my question exactly. Is like, that's really hard, and I really want to do it, but it's, you know, it's hard to challenge the people you love on the beliefs that they may have that may be really you know, harmful. So do you have any advice on that? No, but <laughs> no, but you know, listen. I, and and I threw it out there because at least you're thinking about it. Today, when I was on the train from D.C., the guy sitting next to me, you know, we started a conversation. I usually don't talk to people because I don't really, <laughs> I don't really want to have conversations. But uh, on the on the train, because you're kind of captive. But he, you know, as the conversation went on, he's like, he went to Harvard Business School. He's an investment banker, and he's got a company in Dubai, and. You know, he's doing, but you know, he wasn't, he wasn't like a real buttoned up, you know, kind of Wall Street looking guy. He was just kind of a, you know, schlubby looking guy who apparently had made a lot of money. But we were taught, but I said to him what I was coming to do, what I was coming to Rutgers to do. And he said, and we talked about social media, you know, to your point, Joe, about anonymous people. And he said he has two different sets of Facebook friends and one that is a more enlightened set and one that is not really enlightened at all and who are really you know there's a lot of bigoted stuff that goes on on those sites and sometimes the bigoted stuff spills over to the more enlightened people and I said well what do you do and he said I, I just I don't know because it really is hard you don't want to be the person who you know is like you get banished from the table um, and and but is there is there something generational and people don't, they won't believe it. I, I was listening to a, one of the television shows and a, one of the anchors said, during one of the rallies during the last presidential election, there was a man she was talking to, she asked him a question and she said, he said, you know, well, immigrants can commit lots of crime. And she pulled up government statistics and showed him that in fact this is not true, that immigrants you know, commit less crime than native born Americans. And he said, I don't believe those numbers. So it's very hard to argue with people who don't believe it. What, what do you do? I do my best. Mm -hmm. I, you know, <laughs> I, try, I pull up the numbers, and it mostly just doesn't work for a lot of people. Like, they just, I don't know. It's really, you know, challenging. Right. No, it is. I, you know, and I, I mean, this is that again. That back to the real American thing. I, you know, I, the number of people who have no interaction with people of color, who are afraid that we are attacking them and that we're all on welfare. <laughs> you know, I mean that, and they, they they have no frame of reference, but other than somebody is you know telling them these myths. There's, I think there was a question back here. Oh, there's one. There's okay. Got, got you. Uh, hi. 
<laughs> My name is Jocelyn. Um, I'm a double major in journalism and Africana studies here. I'm also the treasurer of the Rutgers NAACP chapter. Um, as someone who has extensive experience in journalism, I wanted to ask you if you feel as though the media can often play a role into this fear mongering that we have going on right now. For example, with a lot of the protesting and grievances that go on in our black and brown communities, we're often depicted, especially on the news, as either disrespectful or violent. And um, I just wanted to ask what your opinions of media coverage of what's mm -hmm. going on are. So, so here's the thing. I have this real thing on my Facebook page that I have tried to shut down when people say the media. And I'm not you know, criticizing you, but the media. And I guess as a journalist, I cannot do the media because it used to, yes, it used to be you know, Walter Cronkite and Huntley Brinkley and um, you know, I can't remember who the, the original person on ABC was, but it used to be three networks, and then it was CNN, and it was the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, your local newspapers, and those were the mainstream media. So now, you can't just say the media. You have to sort of parse it and who is more likely to be accurate and who is intentionally um, spreading misinformation or n biased information and really parse those things apart. Now, having said that, you know, one of the things that I did when I was at ABC was to do a real critique uh, and examination of the images of people of color that appeared on the evening news. And this was during, this was during the period of the O.J. Simpson trial. So, and, and we examined what our file footage was in our library, and all of the file footage of people on welfare were black. The majority of people on welfare were not black, but that was the go-to video, and some of it was five and 10 years old. When I did the study of how many times people of color appeared on the Sunday talk shows and on the evening news, so there was like you know 10 times within a six-week period there was somebody black who had a sound bite about something, if there was a sort of everyday thing of a family watching television or a family who was impacted by a, I hate that word impacted, who was in affected by a flood or hurricane, there were no people of color, as if people of color were never affected. There was maybe, you know, there were two people who were Latino, and there was one who was Asian, and it was all Judge Alito. Who <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that mainstream media have, historically not really portrayed people as normal. And my, sort of my campaign was, can you just have us as like normal family people sometimes? And so, so there, has been, there has been that perpetuation of those stereotypes. But I, but I think you have, you know, it's, it's like what is your media diet? And where do you get your media? Yeah. But I, but I don't think you're wrong. I mean, I think that there is, that people go after the conflict and portray that. Yeah, so you're, I mean, you're, you're, not, you're not wrong. But some, some places are more reliable and some shows are more reliable and, than others. We have another student in the back here and then I can swing up to the front. Um, once again, ma'am, I'd just like to thank you for coming out and speaking to us tonight. My total, my, totally my pleasure. Thank you. Um, so my name is Dilok Butnagar. I'm a second year student here at Rutgers. I'm an Air Force cadet and I'm also an Honors College student. Uh, my question for you is building off what you talked about earlier, the question you asked is, where do you get your news? Um, given your extensive experience with journalism and news media, I wanted to ask you, how do we reach out to people who find their news um, in, for lack of better words, unconventional manners, for, or from uh, sources that may not be the most vetted, mm -hmm. right? Like for, th just, to, just to name a specific institution, maybe like Breitbart, right? There are these bubbles of news. People get all their information from one place or from another place, and so there's this big gap that's led to the polarization of, of our country. How do you propose, or what would you do in an ideal world, maybe, um, to bridge the gap of information? Yeah, people are in their silos, and they're, they're, they're really not, you know, not open-minded to this. And that, you know, part of that goes back to civics education, history, um, teaching people media literacy, you know, and, but if you're past eighth grade and that somebody hasn't taught that to you, I'm not sure how that's going to happen. But the conspiracy theories, I mean, I have my, some of my most highly educated girlfriends, there was a story a couple of weeks ago, I won't even, I won't mention the story, but there was a sort of, they had, a couple of people had begun on a little email chain to sort of say, well, you know, that's what really happened. 
Well, you know, no, really. Where did you get the? Where did you get that? Other than you made something up in your head and you thought that was an interesting story, and so you, you know, you're you're in college. You part of your role as an educated person is to, is to challenge those people around you, as difficult as it may be. But I'll tell you what I tell you what I read. So I used to read five newspapers a day. I can't do that. And I never thought that I would be mostly getting my news online. I thought I was always going to read it in the paper edition. I still get the um, Washington Post delivered every day, the Wall Street Journal delivered every day, and the New York Times on the weekends. I don't, I, the papers stack up, but I have access online. But I still don't get that serendipity that I would get if I just sat down and, and went through the papers. But at the end of the night, you know, after I've checked Facebook and after I've looked, I've looked to see what's trending on Twitter, and, and, and I use, I don't engage in any crazy stuff on Twitter. I really use it to see what the headlines are. But then I say, well, I, haven't, I need to check the New York Times and I need to see what's on the front page. I need to see what's on the front page of the Washington Post. But I also need to look at what's on Politico, and I need to see what's on BuzzFeed, and I need, there, there's just, it's like a fire hose. But, but I do get these digests every day, and so I recommend these, and you can sign up for them. Columbia Journalism Review, uh, Axios, um, the Washington Post has a daily digest, the New York Times has a daily digest, the, Washington, the Wall Street Journal has a daily digest. Uh, reliable sources on CNN gives me a lot of the media. Uh, headlines. Sometimes they're the same articles on each one, but that's what I read when I'm on the elliptical every morning. That's, what, that's my study time. But you, you know, we have to be an educated populace. Those of us who have the, you know, the advantage and the privilege of being more highly educated, I think, really have to play a strong role. And without being a snob about it to other people who don't, but to be an ally. Uh, because we've got to form a more perfect union, and that's an ongoing struggle. So I'm going to be one of those annoying people who takes a long time to get to the question. Okay. For starters, my name is Ruth Berger Goldston, and uh, I was at I love you, Jack. Harvard. Thank you. I was at Harvard and Radcliffe the same time as you. I graduated, I think, a year before in '73. And Kathy Kleeman, I knew your sister Alice. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a small world. Um, but by way of more background, I have a PhD in psychology from Rutgers and um, have been practicing as a clinician for a number of years now. One of the things that um, really grabbed me in graduate school was um, a professor who was doing a lot of studies on the emotions. And the way it was presented has proven to be, for me, a really um, powerful and effective tool for understanding an awful lot about the world. In my own work, it comes out in, uh, particularly when I talk to couples and see what goes on between them. Um, the emotions are things that you know live in your limbic system and you know they're very primitive and they take over a lot of the time and our emotional expressions um, are you know oftentimes not even available to us um, as as information but they are available to the other person and um, in short um, I think that uh, a lot of the conversation that's going on now and particularly the conversations going around the Thanksgiving ta Thanksgiving dinner table um, are often emotional conversations and particularly that they are focused on power and domination um, and many of the messages that come from um, uh, the current administration and other people who work with them are often cast in those terms so that the emotional response comes first and oftentimes it's something that silences you. The issue of, you know, bringing in facts and I, I don't even listen to what they present as facts anymore because they're not and, um, and I listen for those emotional conversations. So question, um, maybe to have a conversation about this at some point, but I guess I wonder, could we, could we learn how to identify that and start to have conversations about, um, you know, when you call someone on it, when you say, you know, I think, you're, I think what you're trying to do right now is just, you know, 
have power over me. Is that what you're trying to do? Um, that that might be a better, it'll be a surprising response mm -hmm. <laughs> to someone who's expecting you to uh, come up with facts and figures that they can refute or just say, oh, I know better or whatever it is. So might there be a place in our society for well, such a conversation? Yeah, so we need to have a therapist at every Thanksgiving <laughs> dinner. <laughs> but it is, there, you know, with a lot of stuff right now is about emotion and it's about it and it's about fear and instilling fear in people in order to get a certain control over them and to manipulate them. And, and a lot of people are falling for the okie doke and allowing themselves to be manipulated. Yeah, I, I'm, I, you're to it's totally true that it's th these uh, arguments. Uh, you know, I have an interesting, this is like an, a Rutgers person story. Um, now painter who um, lives in Newark and now has just written this fabulous book called uh, Old in Art School. I highly recommend it. But now, came, now after having been you know, a premier historian uh, on the faculty at Princeton, retired at 64 or five and decided she was gonna go to art school. And she came to Rutgers for art school as an undergraduate in her 60s. And so it is a very interesting journey that she, that she describes. And then she went to RISD to get her master's. But one of the things she describes, because Nell is Nell, among Nell's many books, and she's, a, she's quite a scholar, but among her many books is uh, The History of White People. And so you should, <laughs> it's an interesting, she sort of, how this you know, sort of construct was created. But she had, she had one of the most interesting responses to people who say things that are just kind of stupid. She was at a, um, and, and I will say Nell's husband is white, and so that, I mean, that's important to have this in context. She was at a dinner party in the Catskills with friends, and um, one of her friend's husbands, who's a lawyer, who is white, said something to her, and I guess he'd had too many glasses of wine, because he said, aren't you lucky that you're here and not in Africa? <laughs> <laughs> now, Nell, who has lived in Africa, who has lived in many places, said, well, what part? <laughs> what country? What part of that country? What are you talking, so it's sometimes coming back at people with, well, can, tell me more. And I'm gonna <laughs> use that, it is classic for me. So like, tell me more about how you came to that conclusion, let's talk about that. Because my first reaction is like, shut up, leave me alone <laughs> and go away. But if I could control my emotions, then I might sort of get to the bottom of it or, ha or make somebody question themselves. Good evening Hi. and welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Francis White and I'm a proud graduate of Douglas College. Yeah. Class of 1972. All right. So I see Rutgers up there and I said, we're at Douglas. Why do they keep saying Rutgers? But anyway. <laughs> Kathy and I feel that way about Radcliffe. That's the same. Right, right. <laughs> I um, enjoyed your presentation and I'm reading this book called Stamped from the beginning. And I think that's an excellent book. I would recommend everyone to read it if they haven't read it, because it gives you an in-depth historical perspective that we don't know about. Well, most of us don't know about it. So thank you again. Um, hopefully, we could get more young people to become engaged. Um, I retired as an educator after 40 years teaching history. So mm -hmm. a challenge, the textbooks are still horrible. I don't know how we could change that. You know, the misinformation, I feel, sometimes I feel really sad because a lot of the so-called facts, like you were talking about facts, they're just blatant lies. Hmm. So I think that's why when you spoke about anger, a lot of young people are very angry because we have misled them. So hopefully we could turn that around. I really don't have a question. I just wanted to make a comment. <laughs> but thank you thank so you. much. But you know, and that that book, I, that's stamped with is one of the books on my you know high stack of you know nightstand unread books. But there's also a book about the um, history of Rutgers, African Americans at Rutgers, which is also on my unread stack of books. But I bought it when I was invited to come, and I will read it. But I think that's you know sort of ground zero of understanding you know this community. Well, thank you for being here. Um, 
I'm a new journalist of, of a few years and a broadcaster, and um, I've been listening to you and absorbing, and um, maybe it can give me a pep talk, because a few years ago, I, I realized that uh, everything's swirling around with uh, anger uh, and polarization, uh, uh, that I, I think at the best I can do is reach just 50% of an audience because um, I don't think I can get to the other 50% ever. So I'm, in other words, I'm demotivated. Uh, and actually, I'm, I'm a journalist older than you. Um, so I thought <laughs> I'd- Not much. I thought I'd just <laughs> throw that in there. But what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying is uh, uh, these last few years that I've been doing journalism and broadcasting, uh, I realized I just have to try to reach an audience when I would be responsive. So am I being less than a journalist by not trying my best to reach everyone? No, I mean, uh, no. I think you have to, I mean, I think part of the reason, I, I mean, there are many reasons why podcasts are so popular. But I think podcasts give people a chance to, you know, hear and go into depth in some of the conversations. Like you can't have a 15 minute interview on most shows on NPR. That's the other, another one of my sources of, of news. But I, no, I think you have to, you have to interrogate and, and investigate the things that you think need to be uncovered. I mean, for me, that's what being a journalist is. It's like, what is the thing that I want to go down that rabbit hole and I want to expose? Or what is that thing that I want to highlight and celebrate because somebody is doing a really great job about changing something, about bringing about change, about, in my, for me, it, social justice is very, important, how is somebody educating children? I mean, it's just, you know, I'm just a story I was talking about earlier today, and this is t totally off the subject, but I was talking with the cha vice chancellor about students, first generation students, college students, and some of the issues that people face and just getting used to an environment. And then we talked about students in high schools and students who don't have a lot of resources. And this seems really weird but for, for me to talk about this, but there is a, there's a high school somewhere in America, I'm not sure where, I saw it on a news program, where the kids don't have, you know, they don't have money to buy um, detergent to wash their clothes. And so the school has now... In Newark. In Newark. Okay, thank you, thank you. So you probably read about it. So the, so the school has installed washing machines. Well, you know, just things like that, those are stories that really excite me, in addition to, you know, serious investigative uncovering corruption. But, there, but being a journalist to me is finding a story that illuminates some small part of the world. You don't, you're not going to make everybody happy. And even when you find the truth, there are people who aren't going to believe it. So do you. <laughs> <laughs> and we could certainly keep you here all night, but why don't we take these last three student questions sort of in sequence, and then if you want to respond to all or, or any one okay. of them. I don't need a microphone. I just stand up. Oh, OK. All right. Hi, my name is Raymond. Uh, you can consider me as a prospective Rutgers student, currently a sophomore at a local high school. And uh, first of all, I want to say, God bless you, ma'am. Thank you for coming here tonight. Thank you for taking, oh, oh, lower. <laughs> Thank you for taking um, time out of your day in order to come to speak to all of, of us. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. And as somebody who's considering to double major in political science and journalism, I was wondering what advice would you have for a person who's willing to go out into the world um, despite all the dangers that one might face while covering certain issues. Uh, what advice do you have for a person who's willing to expose the truth and to combat all this fear and anger that plagues our world today? Yeah, yeah well, you know, I think the, the, one of the key things about being a journalist is making sure that you get your facts. You know, just don't rush. Make sure that you dig and dig and dig and that whatever you try to publish is accurate. Um, and I would say, you know, in, that I'm glad that you're thinking of double major with political science because there are a lot of journalists who are just generalists and don't have any particular expertise in an area. Um, so g get some expertise in a particular area. And I think maybe, you know, working in something other than journalism for a while, I don't know whether it's, I'm not going to recommend investment banking necessarily, but, <laughs> you know, but doing some, doing some other things and getting some other experience. M my goddaughter um, majored in economics, but she really wanted to be a journalist, and then she went to work in 2007 and the market crashed, and she couldn't work on Wall Street anymore, and now she's, a, she's an editor at the 
Atlantic, but she's really valuable to them because she understands business and she understands economics. So I would say, you know, make sure you have expertise. And the other part is that you can start your own website, you can start your own podcast, and you can start interviewing people who are interesting to you and sort of build up your journalism chops while you are still in high school. I just, isn't there, there's a new podcast, a high school student is doing a Supreme Court podcast. Mm -hmm. yeah. So check that out. I mean, there are all kinds of ways that are open to you now that, you know, when I started out and just getting a byline in a magazine was a big deal. Now you can be your own publisher, but be your own publisher with accurate information. Hi, my name is Yara, and I am a first year student here at Rutgers. Um, my question has to do with this topic of anger and a lot of the frustration Americans are feeling and they're directing it sometimes at minorities, at people of color um, as a result because they don't know where to channel it. Um, I wanted to ask you, how do you think we should approach these people and maybe show them how their politicians might be working against their own interests? Um, if we're talking about economy, the tax cuts to the very wealthy, it's affecting a lot of Americans, but they are, you know, directed towards, well, we're going to blame immigrants, we're going to blame Muslims for this problem. So how could we take that anger and show them that, you know, we can fix it, but it's not going to be getting rid of people of color and it's not going to be getting rid of immigrants? Yeah, because scapegoating is, you know, as American as apple pie in some, in some <laughs> ways. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, that is a, that's a real tough thing because when you, you know, having an argument with somebody who you don't know you don't know what their reaction is going to be, and that's why it's important to vote out the people who encourage that behavior. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Neha, and I'm a freshman. And uh, earlier this week, I submitted my first article about uh, to the Daily Targum, our newspaper, about how people should be more willing to discuss racial issues in the United States. And I was wondering if you had any suggestions for how in your writing um, you can remain optimistic while not appearing idealistic and being realistic. It's okay to be idealistic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, it's a, it is a really tough thing. I, 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 I mentioned this, I sat next to a guy, and I, I think I mentioned this, I sat next to a guy in an airplane who was a former DC cop and very nice guy and his wife, and he wanted to talk to me about race on the airplane. I'm like, oh God, <laughs> can, I, can I do, here's my, here's my syllabus, <laughs> can you please, here's some books for you to read because, you know, I can't, you know, you're starting, you, you have not done the, edu you haven't tried to educate yourself before you have come to ask, but I don't want to be rude because you are actually honestly asking me a question, so I'm like, what can I do, um, you know, to further the conversation. I don't, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. When you, you know, when you're trying to educate people, sometimes you can just, you, you, maybe at the end of every article, say, here's, here's some further reading. ta Coates did an interesting thing when he was first started, before he wrote uh, some of the books that he's famous for. He started something and, you know, really looking at the Civil War and some of the early readings on race, and he just did a little syllabus and he made a comment on it. Maybe that's something that you do for the newspaper is you start a column where you say, here's, some of the, here's the book that I read this week and here's what I learned. Maybe you can learn it. Now, I, I mean, I've also had the other experience. I have a Facebook page that's more about history. And, you know, and I post things, you know, positive stories about black people, you know. <laughs> and, I, and I posted something when um, the Obamas got the Netflix series. Uh, you know, it's just a little passing, isn't that nice? And I got a, you know, a post from a guy who's like, they're criminals and blah, you know, it's like, <laughs> and I'm like, really, where did you come from? And why are you, <laughs> why are you even here on my page? Because if you don't <laughs> like the page, you don't have to come here. And then he engaged me and he was like, well, this and this and that. I said, well, here's some books for you to read. And he said, I'm not reading that crap. <laughs> so you, sometimes there's just like nothing you can do, but you just do your best to plant the seeds and Hopefully, it will take with one or two people. <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry to stop. Um, like all of you, I wish we could keep talking and talking, but also like you, I'm sure you would agree that we found the right person in our quest to be forming a more perfect union. So please join me in thanking Aliyah Bender. <laughs>